Good morning. Well, you may not have heard the names uh, Spark and NVIDIA together uh, much before, but I want to continue the process of motivating that this pairing is going to be extremely critical going forward for the future of AI and data analytics. And that's because, and that's because if you're a data scientist and you're developing in R or Python or MATLAB, etc., and you want to scale out to a very large problem, you can either scale out across nodes to a many-node computation, and that's why we're here, that's what Spark does, or you can take advantage of the parallel computation capability of GPUs with thousands of nodes per single core. And so um, uh, m machine learning and uh, database queries have already been developed, as we've learned and we know, uh, in production scale problems on Spark, uh, but deep learning is just being rolled out in the world. And so right now, people have been developing deep learning in, academ in academia and uh, playing in sandboxes. But what I want to motivate is as we get to the point of rolling out deep learning into production, uh, this is going to happen, which is that we're, deep learning will require so much computational horsepower that we're going to need to combine these two approaches and both scale out and scale up to be able to uh, deploy deep learning especially in a reasonable amount of time. So I want to talk a little bit about motivating that, review some cases in deep learning, and then talk about how excited we are at NVIDIA at the future of injecting deep learning and GPUs uh, into Spark. So, so uh, what we focused on in NVIDIA for the last uh, year or two, especially intensively, is making sure that all of the deep learning frameworks that you've heard of, TensorFlow, CAFE, CNTK, Torch, Tiano, uh, work perfectly and integrate seamlessly with CUDA and, and tap into all of the computational power of GPUs. But more and more, as companies, as deep learning goes from academics to companies and from the sandbox and R&D to looking for deployment, uh, they will need to have a production environment. And we, we really believe that Spark can be one of the perfect production environments. And so I want to talk a bit about how GPUs in, inserted into Spark uh, via the frameworks, the deep learning frameworks, um, is something that we now want to turn our attention to and that we think is very important. So to shift gears and cover a little bit of history of deep learning, so deep neural networks have been around for decades. But in 2012, something very special happened. Fei-Fei Li from Stanford and her team, at great effort, um, took, created a database of about 10 million images and uh, labeled it and annotated it so that every image, the main object, was labeled. And what people did is they took that large labeled database applied it and trained deep neural networks with it. And many of you will know this, but this training process involves, t involves taking sort of a blank slate deep neural network and pruning the connections and modifying the weights to basically make the predictive accuracy go up. And it's essentially a minimization gradient descent, an optimization problem. And in doing this, you bring in the data in mini batches and you feed it terabytes or in the future even petabytes of data. And when your accuracy is as good as it can get, what you do is then you deploy uh, this fixed model, uh, this neural network in what's called inference or prediction mode. And so you, you put in an image in this case, and it, and it tells you what the image is. And so something very special happened in 2012. Uh, once people started using this unprecedentedly large data set to train neural networks, um, in 2012, at the annual computer vision contest, which uh, typically was won by hand-coded machine learning algorithms, and the accuracy was usually around 74%. In 2012, for the first time, uh, a deep neural network trained on this ImageNet massive database and trained via GPUs, and it still took something like a month, basically broke the record by 10%. And for the last uh, four or five years, the, the accuracy has gone up, and in the last year or so, it's exceeded the limits of human performance. It's around the 99% accuracy range now. And so that's very important. For some problems, 74% may be good enough. But if you're trying to build an autonomous driving car, 
you know, if, if, it, if it crashes or doesn't work 26% of the time, that's, that's not good. So is, is deep learning just a spectacular one-trick pony? The answer is no. The excitement started to build when it was realized that deep learning could do a tremendous number of things. So Fei-Fei Li's group said, well, what if we don't just annotate the images with that this is a dog, but we use a scene annotation. And very quickly, they were able to show that the neural network was able to reproduce very good scene annotations that you can hardly distinguish from ones done by humans. Uh, it's not a long step from that to realize that, well, if I'm, if I'm a radiologist, I can take a chest x-ray, I can take the radiologist annotation and train a deep neural network model that can basically replicate with fairly good accuracy, this is very new work, but what the human doctor uh, would have said. So another uh, success, and this is, uh, this is from Google, is in robotics. So it turns out that training robots to mimic human-like behavior is actually very difficult because it involves uh, a lot of uh, dynamics physics simulations. It also involves how you grip and grasp. And so they used reinforcement learning uh, to, train, uh, to train robots. So now, if you want to build a self-driving car, and NVIDIA has a large effort to build end-to-end self-driving cars, including the training, uh, the inference, and providing a developer kit to car companies that would let them do their own custom training and inference, um, you now have vision, you can see, you have robotics, so you can do what a human, how they would react to situations in the physical world. And so you can build a self-driving car, and whoops, go backwards. Here we go. So this is a cityscape data set, and what this is is a trained neural network, and it's running an inference mode on NVIDIA GPUs, and it's detecting different classes. It can detect more things, but what it's showing is it's detecting cars, it's detecting pedestrians, it's detecting traffic signs and lamp posts, and it's doing this all at 30 frames per second. But it has to do it in every kind of weather. So look at this car out here on this snowy road. This car is white on gray on white, and look at this truck in the distance. Even a human can barely pick it up, and the neural network barely picks it up, but it does pick it up. So this is really quite remarkable performance. And remember, all these successes have happened in the last three or four years. The vision also knows every pixel of the object. It can do a pixelation segmentation, and this is very important because the purple is the way that you can calculate drivable surface, which is very important for planning the trajectory. And so there's two ways you can do it. You can do trajectory planning, or you can use something called deep reinforcement learning to actually do end-to-end -end pixels to decision and steering the car. And uh, in, uh, in the last year, something uh, so successful happened that it even shocked AI experts around the world, which is that uh, Google's DeepMind team programmed uh, a deep neural network called AlphaGo to beat the world's best Go player. So the significance of this is it's not just something that we can all do, and once we learn it, we're pretty good at it, like driving a car. It's the hardest game in the world being played by the best player in the world. And it's different, it's a significantly different from chess in the fact in chess, you can brute force it. You can just calculate all the combinations. But in AlphaGo, there's ironically over a Google, 10 to the 100 of combinations. And so you can't just brute force it. You really need a strategy. And so Google used something called deep reinforcement learning to program this. And it really shocked the world, including the best AI researchers when this happened about a year ago. And so people started to actually ask themselves, well, why is deep learning so good? What what does deep learning learn? And so to step back for a second and contrast it with machine learning, we know that that takes inputs. And typically what you try to do is find a handcrafted algorithm or feature representation that can basically learn the features. And then the, the learning algorithm to extract those features is actually fairly simple. But the limitation of this approach is that it's limited to feature representations that humans can build. And so for some problems, there's simply too many combinations, and that's one of the reasons why for image classification, it didn't work well enough. And so 
just briefly, the way that deep learning works is it actually uses this massive amount of data to extract the features. And so the way that deep learning will detect a face, this is a network trained on people, is it breaks it down, not into the million pixels, let's say if this is a megapixel image, but it learns automatically this basis set of lines and edges. And it turns out that's the exact same basis set that we have in our, in our visual co cortex system that we learned as animals over millions and tens of millions of years. And it uses these basic features to put together more complicated features in a hierarchical fashion. And so you get, for example, pieces of a face, and then these get assembled into faces. And so just one more comment on that. What's really interesting is you see this automatic feature extraction can handle very high dimensions. If this is a megapixel image, what deep learning immediately does is it finds a basis set of maybe only 64 or 100 basis functions that can essentially reconstruct this human face. So from a million pixels, a million dimensions, down to a very small number. And so that's one of the powers of deep learning. Um, now, I think that one of the next uh, big proving grounds for deep learning will be to take on some of the predictive analytics problems that have been handled by machine learning. And so just to give you two quick examples of that, uh, this is a paper on deep learning applied to mortgage risk. So this is about five terabytes of data. This is 120 million mortgages over 20 years in the US. And so the deep learning model, this is comparing the observed number of prepayments of the mortgage versus the predicted number. And this black line is perfect. This is 100% accuracy. And you can see the blue is the deep neural network model. And it's almost glued to the perfect prediction here. And this is a logistic regression model. And it's obviously much less accurate. Um, for time, I'll just comment on this for a second. But this is work by IBM. They used a deep neural network to predict inventory management in one of the largest retailers. And what they did is they took their inventory as a function of time, but they merged in external data, like week ahead weather forecasts and Twitter feeds. And by seeing that the weather a week ahead was going to be hot, it was able to predict an anomaly, which is the red deep learning model, in actual demand, which is this gray bar, that the classic model could not predict. Now, this was a fairly small problem, but you can imagine problems with massive data. And so that tees up the need, uh, oh, and as one last comment, um, in things like uh, predictive analytics for fraud and cyber, there are literally thousands and tens of thousands of features. And so I think, for example, someone alluded to a Capital One machine learning use case. We believe that uh, in the near future, that these companies will try to apply deep learning autoencoders to do even better fraud detection and cyber detection. So without belaboring this slide, the need to scale up and out is huge. The data is truly huge. It can be easily terabytes going to petabytes going to beyond. And so to train all this big data, you'll absolutely need a massive amount of computing power. And so this is a, a deep learning supercomputer in a box that NVIDIA has recently released called the DJX1. And just to put things in perspective, this is eight of our latest GPUs uh, connected in a very fast uh, interconnect mesh. And we've worked very hard to make sure that all the major AI frameworks are optimized for this box. And again, to put things in perspective, this has more teraflops computing power than the most powerful supercomputer from 2002 to 2004, which was in Japan. It had its own building, and it was a one or $2 billion machine. And this has more power. It's equivalent today to about 250 regular CPU-based servers. And so how is that even possible? Well, what's happened in the last 10 years is that computation power of CPUs has really stopped scaling with Moore's Law and for other reasons. But the computational power of GPUs has continued to scale, and this gap has widened and continues to widen, both in two important respects, both in uh, teraflops, or co raw computation power, compute power, and also in memory bandwidth to go grab the data. And this is actually very important for large-scale problems when you have to connect a whole bunch of GPUs and scale out. And so 
Um, we're very excited uh, about uh, the approach that um, Spark is taking with uh, data frames, and I want to talk a little bit about that. So one thing that people can do now, but it's perhaps not ideal, is if you're playing in a sandbox with deep learning models, for now, not in production, you can take your data out of something like a Spark cluster, you can move it to kind of a sandbox with one of these deep learning supercomputers, get a result and move back. But obviously, when you want to deploy for production, uh, that's not uh, ideal. What you'd really want to do is you'd be, and the reason for that is, by the way, is that here you're essentially moving the compute, to, you're moving the data to the compute, but that's not what you want to do if you have petabytes of data. You really need to move the compute to the data. And so that's the approach, for example, uh, that Spark Tensor Frames has taken. And so basically, it takes a data frame, and this has been covered before, um, but it takes a data frame, uh, and it wraps TensorFlow in this connector called a Tensor Frame. And because we've already optimized TensorFlow to run on a heterogeneous system where CUDA and GPUs are seamlessly integrated, it sort of automatically works. And so the beauty of that approach and what we love about it at NVIDIA is that you can bring down all of your tools from the Spark ecosystem and it'll just run seamlessly, ideally. And so we think that's absolutely great. Um, and so just one example, this is courtesy of Tim Hunter at Databricks. So admittedly, this is not deep learning, but this is an example uh, where they took uh, tensor frames and actually use TensorFlow running on GPUs to accelerate a complex uh, numerical function that's heavily, embarrassingly parallel, as we say. And so here's the results. They speak for themselves. So without GPU, with a Scala user-defined function, when you optimize it, you can get a bit out. With tensor frames, you get even more. And finally, when you attach the computation to GPUs, you can see what happens. So we really think this is the future. Um, I'm running late, so this is my last slide, but we're very excited about the ecosystem that's, that's nucleating and building around Spark. Um, there was a good talk in the June Spark Summit that you can go look at that covers a lot of projects to inject deep learning into Spark, and some of them are working on GPUs, and it covers the approaches of those. So thank you very much.